Hi, I'm Carl Sagan. This is a place where I often work in Ithaca, New York, near Cornell University. Maybe you can hear in the background a 200-foot uh, waterfall right nearby, which uh, is probably, I would guess, a rarity on Mars, even in times of high technology. Science and science fiction have done a kind of uh, dance over the last century, particularly with respect to Mars. The scientists make a finding, it inspires uh, science fiction writers to write about it, then uh, a host of young people read the science fiction and are excited and inspired to become scientists to find out more about Mars, which they do, which then feeds again into another generation of science fiction and science. And uh, that sequence has played a major role in our uh, present ability to get to Mars. It certainly was uh, an important factor in the life of Robert Goddard, the American rocketry pioneer who I think more than anyone else paved the way for our actual ability to go to Mars. And it, uh, it certainly played a role in my scientific development. I don't know why you're on Mars. Maybe you're there because we've recognized we have to carefully move small asteroids around to avert the possibility of one impacting the Earth with catastrophic consequences. And while we're up in near-Earth space, it's only a hop, skip, and a jump to Mars. Or uh, maybe we're on Mars because we recognize that if there are human communities on many worlds, the chances of us being rendered extinct by some catastrophe on one world is, uh, is much less. Or uh, maybe we're on Mars because of the magnificent science that can be done there. The, the gates of the wonder world are opening in our time. Or maybe we're on Mars because we have to be, because there is a deep nomadic impulse built into us by the evolutionary process. We come, after all, from hunter-gatherers, and for 99.9% .9 of our tenure on Earth, we've been wanderers, and uh, the next place to wander to is Mars. But whatever the reason you're on Mars is, I'm glad you're there, and I wish I was with you.
And, and at the end of the day, the thing is, manned space flight, kind of awesome, kind of wish I could be part of it, but there isn't the budget in the world right now to do it right. We want to learn, we want to explore, we want to do science, and we have to use robots to do that. Hold on. <laughs> I'm sorry, should I just calm down? <laughs> no, bring it on, Dr. T. You're supposed to <laughs> testify. Plus, we got questions. <laughs> Tell the truth. I, and I want to make sure we get the questions, but I got to rebut gonna... that. Rebut that. Okay. Uh, to say there's no budget in the world, the federal budget is three point something trillion dollars. Doesn't go as far as it used to. If you... <laughs> yeah, it used to be real money. If you want to count to a trillion, it would take you 100,000 years, and that's one number per second every waking and sleeping moment of your life. That's how big that number is, point one. Point two, it's not that we can't afford it, it's that we have chosen to not afford it. Mm -hmm. I tweeted recently... <laughs> I tweeted recently that the U.S. bailout of the banks exceeded the 50-year budget of NASA. You want to put something in context, if you want to do something with three and a half trillion dollars, you can do whatever you want. The what, whatever you judge to be important to the profile mm -hmm. of the nation that you were trying to just build and to sustain. So I submit to you that when you look at the NASA budget, and I'm tired of saying this, but I'll have to say it again. The NASA budget is four-tenths of one penny on a tax dollar. If I held up the tax dollar and I cut horizontally into it four-tenths of one percent of its width, it doesn't even get you into the ink. So I will not accept a statement that says we can't afford it. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.